Good morning and happy Sabbath. I am Carmi Uzunian and I want to welcome each one of you to the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church this morning. We want to take an opportunity to recognize our guests that are here with us, our visitors, and we are just glad that you have chosen today to worship with us. We want to give a special welcome to those who might be joining us on our live streaming service. Thank you for joining us, and we pray that you would have a blessed Sabbath day, and that if you are ever in our area, we hope that you join us here at the church. To our friends who are here this morning, we would love to get some, to know some of you better if you are visiting with us, so um, please feel free to speak with one of our greeters, our deacons, or one of our pastors um, at the close of the service. We would like, I'd like to bring to your attention some announcements if you would like to get out your bulletin. One that is not mentioned in your bulletin, but that um, there is an insert for, is an upcoming bridal shower for Laura. Our pastor's daughter, Pastor Julian's daughter, Laura, is getting married this summer in Chicago, and we want to celebrate with her and Alex so there is a bridal shower for her on April 22nd that we hope that many of you can join us for brunch that day, okay? Next Sabbath is Communion Sabbath. It's Easter weekend, and there is going to be communion at both the early service and the 11:20 um, service. There will be foot washing during those services and between the services. Next week is a high Sabbath because not only is there communion, but in the afternoon our very own youth pastor, Jeremy Wong, will be um, ordained. And he is inviting um, the church family to be here at 4 p.m. on Sabbath afternoon to be a part of his ordination service. The following Sabbath, there will be a memorial service for Deb Dunson, former member and I'm hoping that many can be here to support her daughter, Abby, and Steve um, during that time. So that will also be at 4 o'clock um, the following Sabbath on April the 7th. On April 14th, many things happening in our church. There is going to be small group training. Okay, so for people interested in small groups, that Sabbath after. There is going to be a small group training. The speaker um, that day um, for that is going to be Pastor Peter Simpson. So if you would like to be a part of that, please let the church office know. And um, it's saying that there will be some further details about that in the coming weeks. And the last thing that I want to mention up front is our VBS program for this summer. If you have noticed the tent up out in the foyer, we are getting ready for our big evangelism event of this, the summer, and our theme this year is Daniel. We are going to be needing lots of volunteers. In fact, Jackie and I this week are going to start putting up the walls of our, um, that's going to be our staging. So we are going to need many, many volunteers to help in many different ways. So we have sign-up sheets out there if you would like to be involved in the crafts with the kids, um, doing drama, um, being in the kitchen, helping create the backdrop. There's many, many ways that you can be involved. So please stop by. We already have forms there that you can register your children, your grandchildren. So we just want everybody to be involved. And so um, please stop by, fill out a form, and let us know what you would like to do. Um, we pray that you would have a blessed Sabbath, and we are glad that you are all here worshiping with us today.
Good morning. It's time for our opening hymn. And I have the choir right here beside me. So this is going to be a great opening hymn. Let's all stand together. And the hymn, When He Cometh, page 218. Now this means that you don't sing because I get upset when you don't sing. But we're going to sing this hymn together, hymn 218. Everyone with me. When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his bright snow adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his own. He will gather, he will gather the gems for his kingdom. All the pure ones, all the bright ones, his loved and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty and around. Little children, little children, who love their Redeemer, are the jewels, precious jewel, his love and his song. Sing it out like the stars of the morning, his bright cloud adorning. They shall shine in their beauty, bright gem for his own. Thank you so much for that. That's a beautiful hymn. I don't think I've sung it since I was a teenager, but it's beautiful. Let's bow our heads for a prayer this morning. You may stand, sit, kneel, but let's bow our heads together. Lord, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for us maintaining here. There are so many of us that have sicknesses, other problems, family problems and things, but you bring us all here together. It was so wonderful to see Dave Barger back walking, truly a miracle, Lord. You take care of us in every way. And thank you for us to be being able to maintain as a choir because we love you, Lord, and we love to sing for you. Bless the speaker today. Bless our service. Keep us in your total care, Lord. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. But at this time, it's time for the offering. But when it comes for the offering, I like all you folks to get happy. So I want you all to stand up and hug somebody and say, I love you, happy Sabbath, whatever. Take a couple minutes here. And somebody come up and shake my hand too. You always forget about me. Yeah, that's the way to do. <laughs> all right. First of all, let me ex explain a couple things to you. This is our new look choir. We may sing in robes, we may not sing in robes, but we'll sing. We're not going to sit up here, it's too much problem. Taking the chairs, putting the chairs up, putting the chairs down. And someone said they had my seat here for me already. <laughs> 
Thanks a lot, Muncie. I love you too. <laughs> you know, as we get a little bit older, but you know, it's just like the rag man said, it's the same old story, same old song. Any money, any money, we're still running kind of behind. Uh, and like I used to sing that song, the weather outside is not so frightful. And all of you look so delightful. Our budget funds are still low. We need your money before you go. <laughs> and then the other part, so won't you be a honey and give us some more of your money. And then everything will be all right. You all can sleep to better at night. Da -da -da. Isn't that worth something right there? So what I'm trying to say is uh, we're running behind this whole quarter has been about what in our Sabbath school lessons? One word. Starts with an S. You don't study your lessons, do you? S stewardship, right? That's all it talks about. Every week, stewardship, and that has to do with me and it has to do with you. So we need you to, to dig a little bit deeper and help us to get, I think we have the little slip in here. I didn't have a time to look at it this morning, but it tells us that we're running behind and it's somewhere anywhere between 10, no, there's not one here today. It runs between 10 and $15,000. We always fall down a little bit in January and it just starts building up. You're doing better, but you ain't done good enough yet. Pardon my vernacular. We need just a little bit more from you. Deacons, please come forward. I don't want to have to be singing those songs every time I'm up here. Because I'll be asking for money. That didn't sound too bad, did it? <laughs> okay, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you give to us. And what you give to us, we should give back to you because it doesn't belong to us anyway. And you allow us to share a part of it. You only ask for a tenth for the tithe, and then you ask for that extra that we need to keep the lights on, the air conditioning, the organ running, everything else. Please, Father, help us to learn to give till it hurts. And if you give till it hurts, then it finally stops hurting. Bless us this day with the offering. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
<laughs> Hi, Palmer. <laughs> sit down. Okay. You want me to sit down? Oh, yeah, I know you want the microphone. In fact, I might stand up so you can't get the microphone. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good. So usually there's a whole bunch of kids that comes down like one minute after I start. There, there we go. Yeah. You guys look awesome in your spring dresses and your spring outfits. We're ready for spring, aren't we? Well, today I wanted to talk to you guys about prayer and how important prayer is and how God listens to us, even if our prayers are really, they may not seem very important to you. And he listens to us when our prayers are really, really big, when we're praying about big stuff. So I have actually two stories to tell you today. The first story happened when I was working at Big Lake Youth Camp. How many of you have ever been to summer camp? Has anybody here been to summer camp? You should all go to summer camp. Parents, they all need to go to summer camp. <laughs> Plug for Camp Mohaven. Okay. Um, so I was working at Big Lake Youth Camp at the time, and Big Lake is in the mountains in Oregon. Do you guys know where Oregon is? You do? It's right above California. And at this part, in this part of Oregon, it's dry. So that means that we get forest fires sometimes at Big Lake. And, this, and when we try to prepare for that, so all the staff is trained to know what to do. And the biggest thing that we do is during staff training, before all of our campers come, we have an evening where all the staff goes to every part of camp and we pray. And we send up this like wall of like guardian angels so that we are protected from the forest fires. Now Big Lake Youth Camp has been there for a really long time. What is it? It's almost 50 years now, Dan? Yeah, 50 years. And in that time, there have been lots of forest fires. And not one has reached the camp. It has come right up to the road to the camp, but has never gotten through our wall of guardian angels. The last summer that I was there, we had a pretty bad um, fire. And we were all able to get out. We could see the, the ash falling from the sky and there was smoke in the air. And we were all able to get out, and the camp was not touched, which is pretty amazing. And that's what prayer can do. Prayer can also be for little things. When I was little, I was about eight years old. My brother, over here, loved the Portland Trailblazers. Do you guys know who the Portland Trailblazers are? They're a, they're a basketball team. Do you know who they are? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're basketball players. When I was little, my dad used to take my brother and I to Portland Trailblazer games. And we would take turns get, getting to go because we only had two tickets. And one particular game, it was my brother's turn, and he wanted this basketball. And I believe it was smaller. And it had the Portland Trailblazer logo on it, and it was autographed by which player? You don't remember? <laughs> it was autographed by a really big player. And Dan wanted it so bad. And he had been saving his money and saving his money and saving his money. And finally the day came where he was going to go and get that basketball. And you know what? He couldn't find it. He couldn't find the money anywhere in the house. And we were looking and looking and looking and looking and we couldn't find it. And I said, Dan, we need to pray. And he said, Heather, that's stupid. I'm not going to pray. And, <laughs> and finally he agreed and we prayed. And we started to look again. And you know what? We didn't find it. We couldn't find it anywhere. So finally we had to leave. And as we were leaving, we had to stop at the mailbox. And my mom got the mail, and Dan was looking through it, and he found a letter from my grandparents. You see, about two weeks earlier, it was my brother's birthday. And in that card was the exact amount of money he needed to get his basketball. So you see, God cares about big, big things like forest fires, 
he also cares about basketballs because you guys care about those guys. He cares about what you care about, and if you pray to him, he's going to listen. All right, we're going to take around our offering. So if I could have you guys come over here and grab a little bucket, and everybody can get out their wallet now, um, <laughs> and we'll go collect our offering.
unmute one's mic. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Our youth are leaving the church, not just one, not just two, but the statistics are really, quite frankly, very alarming. If we had 10 kids, for example, it would look like this. One, two, three, four, five, and six of our youth would walk out of our doors and never return. Can you take me back to the beginning? 59% to be exact in a study conducted by Barna. 59% of the youth that are raised homegrown right here in our very own church are going to walk out and they're not going to come back. And we're so very happy with the four that remain. But the fact of the matter is our retention grade is literally failing. A 60% is not quite good enough. So we appreciate these that we have left, but frankly, with those kind of retention rates, I'm kind of worried that those guys might leave as well. Go ahead and have a seat, guys. So what exactly should we do about it? Barna conducted more study, and they wanted to know, would it be possible to intervene earlier? Is it important to get in there and to make a difference as the children are younger? And that's exactly what they found. For example, they found that a person's lifelong behaviors and views are generally developed when they are young, particularly before they even reach the teenage years. Further evidence tells us this, that a person's moral foundations are generally in place by the time they reach age nine. That is to say that before children even hit the double digits, they have a moral foundation upon which to stand. A person's response to the meaning and personal value of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection is usually determined before that person reaches the age of 18. In fact, a majority of Americans make a lasting determination about the personal significance of Christ's death and resurrection by age 12. Don't play around with Easter, pagan holiday. Take every opportunity to talk to the kids in your life about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because they make decisions about these kinds of things early. So we need to make sure that they're exposed to the information early. Three, Barnes showed data indicating that in most cases, people's spiritual beliefs 
are irrevocably formed when they are pre-teens. In other words, what they found is that adults are really just little kids in grown-up bodies. They generally go on to believe and stand upon a foundation that they have built at a much earlier age. The research revealed that adult church leaders usually have serious involvement in church life and training when they are young. In other words, the children that are going to be involved later on are the ones that are consistently involved in our children's programming now. Barna goes so far as to say, if you want to know who's going to be your pastor, your elder, your deacon, your deaconess, all you have to do is look at your children's ministry and find out who is consistently coming and being a part of your children's ministry. But the thing that's so interesting about that is who decides when children come to children's ministry? It's the parents. I think you missed that. Who decides whether children are present and active and involved in children's ministry? It's the? If you bring children to children's ministry, they're going to be jazzed about it. If you've ever set foot into a children's Sabbath school, you know that's no joke. Children take Sabbath school very plainly. And I remember there was one little pastor's daughter who... One morning she woke up and she went into her parents and she was just dismayed to find that her mother was sick. And she said, honey, I just don't think we're going to make it to Sabbath school. And she stormed off to the other room and said, well, I wanted to go to Sabbath school because I wanted to go to heaven, okay? Children take Sabbath school very seriously and they take children's ministry very seriously, but you got to bring them there. Barna says in two decades, you just take a look at who's involved, who's active, and who is present now, and you're going to be able to tell who is going to be involved in the future. So a couple takeaways from this information. Introduce Jesus early. Introduce Jesus early. Introduce Jesus often and involve your children in church activities, church life, and church ministry. But the real question remains, whose responsibility is it anyway? Whose responsibility is it to expose them? Whose expons- responsibility, rather, is it to make sure that they have the right information at the right time that's age appropriate? And whose job is it to mentor our children anyway? I'm glad that you asked. 1964, a woman by the name of Kitty Genovese was a bartender walking home late at night, Queens, New York, headed home after a long day at work. She was met by an attacker who made his initial attack, got scared off by somebody, came back later, drug the the whole instance out for about 90 minutes, and then finally killed Kitty Genovese. Now, that was very unfortunate. That's not the kind of story that I like to hear or even to tell. But the reason that that story became viral, as it were, in 1964 is because 38 people watched it happen. And it hit the newspapers, and it was presented in such a way like, look at all the people who were in their apartment buildings. They saw the attack, and they heard her crying out for help, but there's only a few recorded instances of people who dialed the number of their friends and said, oh my goodness, I think a woman is being brutally attacked right outside my apartment. What do you think I should do? And some people are being recorded as saying, well, why don't you just come over to my apartment? Yeah, because that's going to stop him. I mean, 38 people. What were they doing? Eating popcorn, painting their nails. I mean, what were you doing that was more important than saving a young woman's life? That inspired two young psychologists to take a look at the conditions under which humans will choose to intervene in emergency situations or choose not to intervene. And the results that they found were rather alarming. They discovered that when there was one other person present besides the person who was having the emergency, only one other person present, that only 85% of those people would choose to help. That's a B average. What were the other 15 people percent doing? It's like the story of the Good Samaritan, but not the Good Samaritan. Only 85% of the people would choose to help. And as there were more people added in, when there were two people, for example, added to that emergency situation, only 62% of the people would help. And when there were five people in the emergency situation, all thought that the other person was doing it. And if they weren't doing anything at all, they thought, well, maybe I shouldn't do anything at all. 
this presents the concept that these two psychologists put their finger on called the bystander effect. We're just going to stand by and let it happen because we don't care. We think it should be somebody else's responsibility. Or we just don't want to do anything. They also coined the term diffused responsibility, which basically explains the concept that the more of us there are, the more diffused the responsibility is, which ends up shaking out to nobody does anything at all. The bystander effect. And I mean, maybe that's the reason why in CPR training, the most important part of the training has nothing to do with breasts and it has nothing to do with compressions, but it has to do with you taking out your little pointer finger and pointing at somebody and saying, you call 911. Someone has to take charge of the situation. Somebody has to say, well, I'll pick up the responsibility. Somebody has to shoulder the load. Who's going to do it in our church? Six of ten youth are leaving, never to return. And we can stand here and we can watch the bottom of whose responsibility is it anyway. The book of Deuteronomy, four lovely speeches that were given on behalf of God by Moses. And Moses is speaking very authoritatively because God has just called these people out from Egypt and they need to know the rules. They need to understand the concepts and the principles. They need to understand that God's laws are the basis of all good things. And Moses is speaking on behalf of God And he says, listen up, this is the commandment. These are the rules. This is the statutes that God wants me to teach you. And I'm going to teach you because I want you to fear the Lord your God, not fear in the American sense, but I want you to honor and I want you to respect. And frankly, I want you to stand in awe of God, not just you, but I want your son And I want your son's son to fear God as well. And and he goes on and he says this, Hear therefore, O Israel. And Moses starts to sound a little bit like a kindergarten teacher here because he starts to get very dramatic and and he starts to really call your attention over and over and over. And if you ever walk by in early childhood education class, you'll hear, one, two, three, eyes on me. Everybody look at my nose. One, two, eyes on you. Listen here. What I'm about to say is very important. Please hear me that's what Moses is doing because they are children of Israel after all so he's saying here therefore O people be careful to do them that it may be well with you hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one look around you the Egyptians they got a lot of different gods they got gods that can go in your pockets they got gods that can jump they got green gods they got gods that can croak and rivet they got gods that can meow and do all kinds of fun things but that's not you you're different you're special you have one God You love him with all of your heart. And it's not the kind of love that you have towards pizza. You love God. And the translation hints at the fact that your soul should cleave to God's soul until it just like, it gets so close, you just can't even get it apart. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. These words that I command you today, they shall be on your heart. You teach them diligently to your children. You teach them diligently to your children. You teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hands, put them as frontlets between your eyes, write them on the doorposts, put them on the gates, put them everywhere. And when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of of this. That's when you drop the bomb. Personal testimony. Son, let me tell you where I was before I met Jesus. Let me tell you about the hell that God has brought me out of. And let me tell you how he did it. Because son, 
the same God that did it for me, he can do it for you. When your children ask, you ought to have a personal testimony to share with them. Because if you don't have a personal testimony, you are not really a Christian. No personal testimony equals no Christian. Because every single Christian has a testimony. Some... They're real sparkly and shiny and pretty. They got all the bells and whistles. There's the motorcycle crash. There's the bringing back from the verge of death. There's the drinking problem that God healed us from and so on and so forth. Not everybody's got an experience like that. But every person has got to have their own personal experience with Jesus so that when your baby asks you, you got something to say. That's the only way that it's ultimately going to work Moses goes on and he says, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. You wrap it up and you tell them, fear the Lord our God, because it's for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. Now let's actually talk about Moses here for just a moment, because we find that the primary responsibility of communicating to our children about Jesus, it rests upon the parents, doesn't it? That came through several times. Listen, 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 listen. Tell your son, tell your son, tell your son, tell your son. The primary responsibility rests upon parents as if parents didn't have enough responsibility, enough. I saw a slide the other day that said, you know, back in the day, uh, all you had to do was feed your children occasionally, and that was a good enough requirement for parenting. Now you have to make sure that there's not enough screen time, that they don't eat too much GMO processed food, and everything is organic, everything is safe, clean, BPA-free, all these kinds of things. As if there's not enough responsibility as being a parent, you remember having your firstborn child, and they wrap them up in the hospital, and it's like time to go. You got to go home, you got the nursery ready, you got everything packed, and, and you're packing up, and you're getting ready to go, and they're wheeling mom out of the hospital I remember in that moment thinking would they still let me leave this hospital if they knew I have no idea what I'm doing like shouldn't there be some more education before I go shouldn't there be some more instruction because you know when you have a newborn every single person wants to tell you how they will die if you don't do it right As if there wasn't enough responsibility, Moses says, and let me tell you this, feed them once in a while, but the most important thing you're ever going to do as a parent is communicate to that child about Jesus. You may not delegate that responsibility to another. It is yours alone. It's the parents. Moses is a perfect example of this, and here's the reason why. Moses was born in the time of Exodus chapter 2, and Exodus 2 was not a good time to be born. There was rumblings, mumblings, rumors that were going around that basically said there was going to be a deliverer that was going to be born. He was going to come, he was going to bust the people out of Egypt, and God be the glory, and all these kinds of great things. But that rumor reached the ears of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't really take too kindly to that. This is around the time that Moses was born. So Pharaoh wanted to make sure that there weren't going to be any baby boy deliverers that was born. So step number one, Pharaoh decides, I'm going to work them harder, and that is going to slow down reproductive rates. (laughs) Hilarious, because it actually produced more babies than it did in the beginning. Well, Pharaoh didn't really like that too much, so now he's going to go to the Hebrew midwives, and he's going to tell them, hey, you know how you guys have been saving babies for your entire lives? You know how you love babies? You know how you dedicated your entire work life to babies? Well, now what you're going to do is you're just going to murder the boys. Just just murder the boys. Do you realize how stupid that sounds? Like, you're going to tell me that you're going to go to a labor delivery nurse, and you're just going to flip them just like that. Just kill the boys. No, it's not going to work like that. The midwives were not shaking in their sandals. They basically said, okay, sure, but they feared God, not man, so they're just letting the boys slide right on by. Pharaoh gets really upset about that, and so he issues issues the third prong of his little plan. He says, basically, I don't care who you are or where you are or how you do it. Take every baby boy that you can find, throw them in the Nile River. I want them dead. And you can imagine... Ugh. 
how sad that was and how many mothers had their hearts just ripped out and absolutely stepped on. It was a devastating time and it was not a good time to be born. The Egyptians were so cruel. They knew that the Hebrews were hiding babies. And I mean, can you blame them? They're hiding babies in their own houses, so the Egyptians take their own babies over. They make them cry because you know as soon as one baby cries, the other baby says, oh, what a good idea. And now the Hebrews have given away their location. They find the baby boy. They take him. They toss him in the Nile. I like the story of Jochebed because the interesting thing is, is that even though she knows she's supposed to put Moses in the Nile, even though she knows there's a good chance that he might end up there, rather than cowering, she just chooses to get creative because after all, Pharaoh never said anything about a basket. She technically follows the letter of the law because Pharaoh wasn't smart enough to think of all the loopholes. And so she makes that little basket with her prayers, with pitch, and with slime. She coats that thing within and without, and with every single fiber of her being, she is focused on that little basket and its precious cargo. She knows that it's time. She puts Moses gently inside. She takes him down to the river, gives him one more kiss, hopes she will be there to pick him up at the end of the day, leaves little Miriam. What a huge job for a little girl she leaves him in miriam's care and you know how the rest of the story goes the angels direct the princess as she comes closer she pops open the lid of that basket and suddenly she reads the story at a glance she's no fool she is impressed by the creativity and the courage of one brave hebrew mother to preserve the life of her child even though it breaks her dad's rule. She says, I don't care what dad says. I am saving this baby. Now, the irony of the situation, of course, is that Jochebed goes on, and she gets paid full time to stay at home. Boy, there'd be a lot more stay-at-home moms if we got paid full time. Amen. Jochebed doesn't have to hide anymore because she is on royal business, but she realizes she is on the clock. She doesn't have much time, so she's got to take all the Christian education that she can, and she's got to squeeze it into 12 years because she's got to give that boy back, and she knows she doesn't have long. She knows there is something special about this baby. She just feels it in her bones that his life has been preserved for some greater work. And so she focuses on him even more than she does on her other children. And she prays and she talks and she prays and she teaches and she prays and she shows him the scriptures. Twelve years. That would be like you having your child until sixth grade and then cutting them loose. She sends him off to the palace where he is surrounded by pagan influences on every side. Sure, he makes a few blunders, but you realize that Moses remains true to the education and the Jesus that she taught him about for 12 years years the interesting thing to me is that Moses he was sharp as a tack early history tells us that he was next in line for the throne he goes from little homeschool right into the greatest most cutting edge most innovative iPads everywhere everybody's got the newest apps school and he goes straight to the front of the class You know what that tells me? That tells me that Moses was not disadvantaged by his Christian education. Amen. Moses was not disadvantaged by his Christian education. Moses was not disadvantaged by his Christian education. Moses was not disadvantaged by his Christian education. In fact, it gave him the eternal advantage. She offered something to him that he never would have gotten elsewhere. And the thing about Jacobed is that she was just a slave. She was in exile. She wasn't even in her own home country. But she taught him what she knew about Jesus. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. 
The great work of life is character building. And a knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education. So if you don't have a knowledge of God, then you never got a true education in the first place. The first and best thing you could ever do is to educate your child about Christ. And when it really comes down to it, it's not about how many letters you have after your name or if your name gets plastered on the side of a building or if you make buku bucks. What really matters is whether you know Jesus or not. And there with a slave at his teacher, Moses walks proudly right into military school. No deficiencies, but stands at the head of the class. God knows what he is doing, and he knows how to bless his faithful children. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. The whole future life of Moses testifies to the work of the praying, working Christian mother. And even though we don't read a lot about Jochebed, there could be an entire book that could be dedicated. I would certainly read it as I know many of us mothers would pour over every word. How did she do it? How did she squeeze all of that education into such a short time? What were the prayers? What were the object lessons? What were the objectives? We'll never know until we get to heaven, but we know that her work for just 12 years, made an eternal difference. And the children of Israel certainly liked it as well. Now let me ask you this question. What about some other Bible characters? For example, what about Isaac? You know, a lot of times we think about the faith of Abraham. Cool. Abraham did have a lot of faith, and sometimes it really did slip up. But I want you to think for a moment about the faith of Isaac. Because after all, what really takes more faith? Think very carefully. What takes more faith? To kill your child because God told you to, or to let yourself be killed in the prime of manhood because God told your dad to do so. What takes more faith? Where had Isaac seen that faith? Before, How did he know? Isaac is a young man and he's in the prime of his life and it's almost like he's getting ready to get it pushed off the cliff here. Now he's going to have to actually use his own little wings and fly. Is he actually going to be able to make it happen? Yes! He has faith and as his little wings begin to fly, we have to ask ourselves, but how did he know how to do that? Because he'd seen it modeled every single day of his life. Lessons are more frequently caught than taught. And what Abraham had taught him is, son, in this house, we believe. In this house, when things don't make sense, we still believe when it doesn't look right, when it doesn't smell right, when it doesn't act right, and son, when it doesn't feel right, we still believe. So that when it comes Isaac's turn to stand up and to make his choice, one last look at dad, that faith that he had, it was just so appealing. I want that too. Wouldn't it be something if the example that you set as a Christian is so appealing that other people, they just want to fall right into it? Wouldn't it be something if the people that work so closely with you and live so closely to you find that the Jesus shines through you so bright they just fall in love with it themselves? Isaac was in the prime of his life. He was stronger, faster, and quicker than Abraham was. And what he could have said is, please direct your attention to that lovely bird right over there. Bye. He also could have said, Dad, I just would like to take the opportunity to remind you that we do not believe in child sacrifices. Isaac also could have said, you know, I would like to improve upon this opportunity here and remind you, you do have another son, and he is always complaining that he's not included in the family events, and this may be the perfect opportunity for Ishmael to just jump right in and to be a part of this little celebration. Or Isaac could have said, you know, mom is not going to like this. But instead, what Isaac said is simply this. I got the faith. 
I'm willing. He'd seen it every single day. What about little Samuel? <clears throat> Just a little boy. You remember the story of Hannah. She prayed so hard. She says, God, if you give me that baby, I'm going to turn him around. I'm going to give him right back to you. And she does that. Imagine how hard it would have been to leave him at the temple with Eli because Eli's sons were not well controlled. Eli was a good man and a great pastor, but a terrible parent. So what would it have been like to leave your own little one, your only little one there with somebody who doesn't necessarily have the spine that it takes to check inappropriate behavior she prayed for that boy before he was born but let me tell you something she prayed for that boy after he was born as well children need our prayers she has that baby she rejoices she drops him off at the temple little eli or little samuel rather he starts going around he starts getting mentored by eli eli's showing him the ropes how to take care of god's house and eli has the distinct privilege of being the first to say son it's not me that's calling you it's god the Bible says this, Samuel was ministering before the Lord a boy clothed with a linen ephod. The Levites didn't even typically start their ministries until they were 25 years old. But Samuel was ex the exception, rather, to that rule. He got right into it, and Eli started mentoring him right away. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him every year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. She made him a little robe because he was a little boy boy there's always room for children in our ministry and if there's not room for children in our ministry it's not ministry worth having the children who are involved are the ones that come and continue to serve us long after we're gone samuel knew this and he also understood the importance of having a mother who prays for you. He understood that parents were the first responders. He understood that they hold the primary responsibility for teaching children about Jesus. But he also saw that corruption was really rising and the tide was really turning and it was really becoming quite a turbulent time for the youth in his day. So he started up a couple of schools. We call them the schools of the prophets. And basically at the time he looked for young men who wanted to learn and, uh, more about the Bible and young men who could be good and wise as, as counselors and that they could give good godly advice to people around them so he looked for these young men and he grouped them together there were two particular locations and he would teach them important things like bible history and law and poetry and he would also teach them how to work so that they would be useful and he also taught them about the importance of music you know you should always be nice to the people who work in children's ministries because we're the ones that choose the songs your children are going to be singing for the next 25 years. You know the little ditties that you can't get out of your head? We pick them. So be nice to us. You know, we don't just teach children songs to take up time to get the wiggles out. We don't do it just as, just as a thing in children's ministry. We teach children songs about biblical principles, character traits, and virtues so that they can tuck that in their heart and so that it can give them a little extra pep in their step so that they can take it with them everywhere they go. Because when they grow up, you have a little boy one day he's going to grow up and he's going to be on a college campus and he's going to be working on his computer and all of a sudden an inappropriate image is going to pop up and he's going to be tempted to click more more show me more you don't even have to go search these things out anymore they search you out he's going to be tempted to click on more but if he listens carefully very very carefully he just might hear a little song that goes like this. <clears throat> oh, be careful, little eyes, what you... Sing it with me. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, 
what you see. And if you have pre-programmed that in there, you can literally help make him stronger. It's another tool in the toolbox that he can use because you took the time to put it in there. One day, your little girl is going to be sitting around a table with a bunch of other young women, and they're going to be talking about political candidates, and they're going to be bashing them, not because of their platforms or their preferences or their views. They're going to be bashing them based on the color or pigmentation of their skin. You remember when that rocked us just a few years ago? And your little girl is going to know that that is not right. That's not acceptable. But if she listens carefully, very carefully, she might hear something that will go like this. Sing with me. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Little nuggets of truth that we're putting away in our heart every single day so that our children can draw on those and use them because they are going to need them. Let's take a quick look at our next young lady, Esther, for example. The Bible tells us this. Mordecai was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at, blah, blah, blah. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day, Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Fast forward. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. You know, the thing that I like is that, first of all, Mordecai takes on a huge responsibility that is not his. It doesn't even belong to him. He did not have a Hadassah before her parents died. But when he sees this huge gaping hole, he says, I will take that responsibility. And he does, but he stays invested because as time goes on, he walks by the palace every single day to see how she's doing. The whole queen thing worked out pretty slick. He could have just dropped her off at the front door, have a nice time, and then he's out of there. But he walks by every single day because he is invested in her. Our youth need people who are invested in them, not to walk in front of the court every day or even the school. That would be weird. But to send them a text and say, what's going on? How are you doing and how are things in the inner circle? Tell me what it's like to be royalty like you. Mordecai stayed invested in Esther and oh, what a benefit that he did because she was able to go on and she was able to save her people with his support. Boy, the foster care system worked a lot better then than it certainly does now. It's estimated that 120,000 are eligible for adoption today. With over 400,000 churches in the U.S., if every one person, excuse me, if one person in every third church, not even in every church, all these bodies that we have here, every third church, if every one family, home, but sadly, every single year, 26,000 children age out of foster care without the support, guidance, care, and love in an adoptive family. And what they learn is that there is no place for you anywhere. No foster care in heaven, folks. But we are not there yet. This is not the ideal situation. Obviously. The ideal situation is for a mom and a dad who love each other, but Jesus Christ more than anything else because it just follows that they would love Jesus too and teach their children how to do the same. But in the absence of the ideal, God has come up with a plan and he says, listen, you got a gap in the family, either physically where there should be a man or there should be a woman, or maybe emotionally, where there should be a man or there should be a woman. Or spiritually, where there should be a man or there should be a woman. I am the father of the fatherless. I am the in my holy habitation. The reason that I like this verse is because God says, when there is a gap, when you need somebody else to pick up the responsibility, pick me. I am ready. And it pictures God as being in his holy habitation where he is and us down here on this earth. But wait, God is here too. 
God is interested and involved and active within our families if we simply ask him to do so. You know, another group of young people who didn't have their parents around and needed God to pick up some of the slack was Daniel and his three friends. It's no surprise when we see him right off the bat in Daniel chapter 1. They're already talking about the food because they know better. Mom and dad have taught them that they can't be eating this garbage and thinking that they're going to get great results. So they say, hey, can we eat the better food? They stick together. It's Daniel and his three friends. No surprise just a few chapters later that we find them not only making it, but going uh, even exceptionally better than their pals. And even further on in the book, we find the three friends sticking together as thick as thieves right in the midst of the fire because not only was God supporting them, they were supporting each other. As our youth are leaving the church, sometimes it's a temptation for them to sit back and say, yeah, that's right, you should work for me, you need to do something for me. But the fact of the matter is, is that youth, if you want more youth in the church, you need to support them too. Because we all know that youth are the coolest people that youth know. So youth need to hang out with youth. And in essence, they make a stronger support system. Another guy who was missing a very important and pressing role model in his life was Timothy. We don't know what happened to Timothy's father. We believe that he died perhaps when Timothy was very young. We know that he was probably Greek, so he probably really wasn't very interested in God. But for whatever reason, he was not there. Paul, later on in his life, takes little Timothy under his wing. Timothy is timid. He's shy. He's not cut out to be a pastor until he meets Paul. Paul takes him under his wing and he mentors him and he teaches him how he should behave and act as a pastor. And one time he throws this out in his letter. He says, you know what? I'm reminded of your sincere faith because it's a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and then your mother, Eunice. And now I'm sure it dwells in you as well. In other words, the way that your grandmother and your mother presented their faith was so attractive and so appealing that, Timothy, there is no way that you're getting out of that home without falling in love with Jesus, too. Oh, we don't have a male role model. I guess we can't teach him how to be a man. God provided. Can you think of a better male role model than Paul? And Timothy became a pastor, changing hundreds of lives. Time fails us. We could talk about Ruth, for example, who was converted by her mother-in-law, or Naaman's servant girl. We know her perhaps as little maid from reading the little Bible stories, bedtime Bible stories there. She knew that there was a prophet in her town that could change Naaman's life, and boy, did he ever. So we come back, and we ask ourselves the question, who really is responsible for teaching our children about Jesus? Who is responsible for teaching our children about Jesus? And the answer is everyone. It doesn't matter if you are a mother or a brother or a father or a sister or a youth or an aunt or an uncle or a foster parent or a stepdad or a stepmom. It just doesn't matter. Everybody has to do it. We can all agree that the responsibility is diffused and that people are not taking this seriously. You choose. Are you a bystander while you watch the church hemorrhage, languish, and die? Or do you do something? Every single purpose person in this room has a child that they can invest in and make a difference with. They are just simply waiting for you Everyone can get involved. One argument that I tire of hearing is this. Where are the Moseses? Young people are just not like they used to be. Where are the Isaacs and where are the Samuels and Esther? And let's talk about Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Our youth really are not that courageous anymore. The fact of the matter is, if you want a Moses, then you have to be a Jacobed. If you want an Isaac, then you've got to have an Abraham. If you want a Queen Esther that will save us, then you must be a Mordecai. If you want a Timothy, then you've got to be a mom, a grandma, a mentor to make sure that it happens. 
These children were not accidents. They just did not happen. These are the children that were born of prayers and effort and tears and labor and obedience lesson after obedience lesson after obedience lesson. There is no lesson that is lost on the Christian child. Every little battle that you have with your two-year-old, you may not sit there. You may not jump on that. You may not eat all of the cookies every single lesson is a lesson in obedience it is teaching children that when you obey there is happiness in this home and when you don't there is no happiness because when they get older they can realize that when you obey God's rules there is happiness and when you don't it's just not there. Who is responsible? Who is responsible for communicating Jesus to our children? It's all of us. I was a junior in college at Southern Adventist University. I knew everything there was to know. Do you remember that time? I had coordinated a worship <clears throat> at an Alzheimer's care facility. Very eye-opening experience. I was not prepared for what I was going to see there that day. It's Christmas time. We're going to tell some stories. We're going to mingle, provide some healthy social interactions, sing some songs to do the works. We got there. Some of the residents were waiting for us. They were laughing. They're sitting in their chairs. They're joking with each other. They're joking with us. Having a great time. We start up the program. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a nurse who's bringing down a woman who is obviously very frustrated. She's very uh, just unnerved. She is just not having a good day. She's wearing all blue. She has bright blue eyes, but you can look at them just one glance and just tell that nobody is home. You've seen that before? And for some reason, I just fell into those blue eyes on this particular day. And I just began to wonder, what would it be like to have a healthy body and an absent mind. What would it be like? I mean, did she have children? Did they love her? Did they come and visit her? Did she have a place to go on the holidays? I just didn't know. My part in the program ended. I went and I just sat at her feet. They had gotten her to sit down. She's sitting at this chair. She's folding the magazine. She's unfolding the magazine. She's folding the magazine, unfolding the magazine, rocking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I tried to ask her her name. She didn't know. So I just sat. And my thoughts began to turn of consequential things. Like, did this woman know about Jesus? I was a junior in the religion department, so maybe I should tell her. But at this point, you know, where the door's closed, would it be upsetting, new material, Maybe I should just let it be. But I began to wonder, what was her eternal destiny, and where was she going to be? Would I meet her again? Would she be able to tell me her name? The program started kind of winding up, and then we decided that we were going to kind of conclude with a classic. Jesus loves me. So we started, and a lot of the residents knew the song, and we were singing, and I was just sitting there, and I was just kind of lost in my own thoughts. And all of a sudden, this hoarse and this raspy voice began to sing. Sing it with me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And that was it. She never said another word again. But that was proof to me that someone along the way who Jesus was. And they could have never known that her life would come to this and that she would be in such a situation as this. 
And I don't know if it was mom or if it was dad or if it was a youth pastor or if it was a chaplain or if it was a friend or if it was a late conversion in life. At this point, I don't know who it was that told her about Jesus, but it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that it was there. Someone, somewhere, had indelibly etched that onto her brain so that even though she had come to this place in life where she couldn't even remember her own own name, she could remember his. Doesn't matter who it was. All that matters is that someone took the responsibility and taught her about Jesus. If time shall last that long and your children experience the same thing with memory loss, what is it that you have drilled into their heads? Brush teeth, brush teeth, brush teeth. Others first, others first. Socks and then shoes. What is it that you have indelibly etched into your children's mind. And, and this comes down to the hard part of the service because some of you are thinking about your children that have gone wayward. And if you've ever talked to a parent with a wayward child, there is nothing heavier. It's hard, isn't it? You know, children, the funny thing is, is that you do the best you can but they ultimately make their own choices. If they think that ketchup would be good on apple slices, they will at some point try it. And that's the hard thing as a parent that you have to let them do that. But if you do your best, you improve on every opportunity. You give them every advantage. You communicate as effectively as possible, then you have done your due diligence. You still get on your knees and you still do everything that you can to pray them back and to keep them there, but you have done your job. Weird thing about parenting is that you do the best that you can. When you know better, you do better. But parents, I'm convinced, they do the best that they can. But when you're doing your best and you ask God to work through you, that's like the bestest you could ever have. Will you take responsibility for the situation that's happening in our church today? Will you pick up the slack Will you take the responsibility? Will you be the mother, father, brother, sister, friend, aunt, uncle, third stepsister, half removed 17 times? Will will you be someone to a child? Will you get involved in our biggest evangelistic campaign here on this campus? We call it VBS. Can you help? Can you maybe throw a dollar in the plate for the youth that are trying to go on a mission trip and make a difference in other people's lives? Can you help at Children's Church by making snacks and singing songs? Are you capable of saying, please sit down, face the front, don't lick her socks? Can you help? Can you take some responsibility for the children that are right here so that the statistics that we lose 6 out of 10, can you take responsibility? Help us help your children stay here. Would you take that responsibility? That's the question that I have to ask for you today. I want you to think about it. As we sing our closing song today, I'd like to invite you to stand and to sing with us, please. Number 653, 653, very fitting for today. Lead them, my God, to thee.
Let's all sing together. Lead them, my God, to Thee. Lead them to Thee. These children dear of mine, Thou gavest me. My God to Thee, lead them to me. Ladies only on the second stanza. Come on, ladies. Everyone, lead them, my God, to Thee, lead them, and only, in for such little one, Christ came a child, and in this world of sin live undefiled. Oh, for his sake I pray, lead them, my God. Everyone now, lead them, my God, to thee. Last stanza. Yea, though my faith be dim, I would believe that thou his precious gift will now receive. Oh, take now lead them my God to thee lead them my God to thee lead them to me let's pray together Heavenly Father, we ask you for the many times that we have shirked our duty and our responsibility. We ask that you would help us to remember the importance of our children. Lord, we thank you for sending your only child to come and to die on a cross for us. We ask that you would be with us now. Give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom, the insight, the discernment that we need to raise your children and to guide them to you. I ask this in Jesus' name and all God's children said together. Amen.